Herb. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I want you to talk about loudly enough. How's that? Is that better? Is it on? Exactly. Is it on? I, have to, I have to practically swallow it. I know I hate that. I think in this day and age, we would have perfected something more sensitive. In any case, um, our speaker was born in Canada. Why I find that particularly interesting, I'm not sure, but it's interesting to me in Quebec. And he has been involved in the field of um, the afterlife and death and dying since his first book in 1994. So this was, uh, he has been extensively involved in this. He, is the, he was the spiritual director of RRC from 1999 to 2009. Uh, he is a psychotherapist and an educator um, and the founder of Death Awareness Advocacy and Training. And this is a topic that's been a long interest to me because, you know, many of my friends, Jewish and non-Jewish, say to me, Jews don't believe in an afterlife. And I'm always saying, well, that really isn't so. But obviously, there's a lot of confusion around this topic and a lot of lack of awareness around this topic. So I'm, I'm looking forward to learning today. Okay, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you very much for inviting me here and thank you all for being here. If you didn't show up, I'd have no reason to be here, so thank you. So it's, it's 9-11 and I wanna do something as part of the bracha for Torah study, but before that, I wanna tell you that I have been teaching, how, how's my mic level? It's good enough? I have been teaching on this topic, specifically this topic, Jewish views of the afterlife for a long time. I was trying to count how many different synagogues I, 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 I've been to, you know, because when you work in the field of death and dying, I'm like writing my obituary 30 years in advance. So, you know, I, 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 so I, it was March 8th, 2020 was the last time I taught anywhere on Jewish views of the afterlife. I had led 
a Shabbaton in Santa Cruz, California, and I was teaching that Sunday in Berkeley. And I drove across the Oakland Bay Bridge and I saw off in the harbor, the, the, I don't know whether it was the Princess Line or, the, or whatever cruise ship was in quarantine. And at that point, we had no clue of what was happening. There were a lot of people on the plane who were already wearing masks, particularly people from Asia. And then the middle of that week, everything shut down. So I have to see today whether I still remember how to teach without being in front of the Zoom lens. You know, so, so, um, so that, that, that's one, one piece that I, I just want to mention. Uh, I want to say my own Shechianu, so join me. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech Olam, Shechianu, V'kiyamanu, V'hiyianu, Lazman Hazeh. We survived it, but it's still going on. I mean, my niece just texted me on here. She, she's got COVID. So, you know, we're not, we're not out of the woods yet. It's very, very confusing in a lot of ways. Um, okay, so I want to do a bracha for Torah study in the following way. There's a teaching that I'll say in Hebrew, because so you'll be impressed that I went to Hebrew school, and then I'll, and then I'll do it in English. Al shloshad varim ha'olam omed, al ha-Torah, al ha-Vadav, al gemilu kasadim. The world stands on three things, on Torah, right? Our study of our sacred text. Avada, what's avada? Work, what else is work? What else is? Wait, no, you're jumping ahead. Avada, work, sir. No, you're still jumping ahead. Wait till I get to Gemilu Chasadim. Avada is spiritual practice. It's spiritual work. And Gemilu Chasadim? Charitable act and committees. <laughs> Committee, right? So that is very much the thrust of Jewish life in that we, we study, we, we pray, and we do good deeds to make the world a better place. I also want to say that we can use those three pillars of Jewish life in thinking about the relationship between the world of the living and the world of the dead. And I want to do that in reverse order. Gemilut chasadim. What's one of the things that we do at the time of a yort site, an anniversary of a death? We say Kaddish. Okay, what else do we do? We light a candle. Give tzedakah. And why do we give tzedakah? To get a 501c3 tax receipt, right? Why else do we give tzedakah? Pardon? And in the traditional understanding we give tzedakah on behalf of somebody who has died because it has a beneficent effect on the state of their soul in the afterlife. They might not have taught you that in a reconstructionist congregation. If Mordechai Kaplan, knowing I'm talking about afterlife in a reconstructionist synagogue, you might drop dead. But there. You were going to say? Right. It literally has an impact on the state of their soul and it make, makes the atonement. Right. And there's a whole tradition ar ar around that. And um, Avodah, prayer, what, what's one of the things that, uh, um, yeah, well, we say Kaddish, right? And, and, and our traditional understanding of saying the Kaddish is that, that our saying the Kaddish, again, not only is good for the bereaved, but also has an impact on the state of the soul in the afterlife. And Torah, have you ever been to a traditional home during the week of Shiva? And then, you know, more in an Orthodox saying, what do they study? They don't study Torah because Torah is pleasurable. You're actually not supposed to study Torah in a Shiva house. They study Mishnah. Mishnah is post-biblical Jewish law. And if you throw up the letters of Mishnah, it, arrives, it lands back down, spells neshama, which means soul. So the, again, the traditional understanding is that we study Mishnah because it's good for the neshama, because it's good for the state of the soul. So I want to dedicate our study here today. I want to dedicate it to all those that we are, that whose names are being, being remembered today from the tragedy of 9-11 of uh, 21 years ago. But I also want to invite you to think about and to name who is it that you want to dedicate 
our study to. So we don't have to do it in a nice order. Just call out in a cacophony of sound the name of those folks that you want to think about here today. Name. Name some. I think this is, I think that's how they should, instead of reading the, the, the York site list, which puts everybody to sleep on Friday night, I think they should just do it as a cacophony of sounds. And, and to all of those, you, know, you notice it was getting a little more crowded in here, the more you call out different names. To all of those named and unnamed, may the merit, may the scut of our study be for the sake of the, uh, of the transformation of your soul. And join me as we say the bracha together or say an amen. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Holy one of blessing to give us the opportunity to soak in these words of Torah. So, um, amen. So I was this 21 year old kid and I knew everything at that point in time. And um, the short version is that my closest friend at that point was killed in a car accident. We had been together one night and then the next morning we were already making plans for his funeral. I mean, I had been with him on a Saturday evening. I walked, I, I, I left, he said goodbye because he would, on, on say Shabbos, he would go see his father. His father was an Orthodox Jew. And um, I was out on a date. I walked out onto the streets of Montreal with a full moon. And I said to the person I was with, you know, there's something very auspicious about that full moon. I don't know what it is, but there's something very auspicious about it. I, I, I took her home. I came home, went to sleep, and 5.30 in the morning, the phone rang telling me that this friend I'd been with a few hours earlier had just been killed in a car accident. And if you would have told me simply you're going to spend many years of your life talking to people about death and afterlife, I'd say, no, thank you. That wasn't, that wasn't how I imagined my life at 21 or 22. But very early on, I felt a sense of his presence. You know, it, we, were, we were at the cemetery. The name of the cemetery said Mount Pleasant Park Memorial Park. There was nothing pleasant about burying a 22-year-old guy in the dead of a Canadian winter, right? During the Shiva, so I oh, didn't it feel like he was in the room? I kept having these experiences. He appeared to me in a dream. And, and, and it wasn't just like, I mean, you know, there, was, there were a number of them. And when I began to look and see what Judaism had to say, there was very, very little around. The, you know, it, this, was, it, it, this was, what, over 40 years ago. And there was like Maurice Lamb, The Jewish Way in Death and Mourning. Jack Reamer wrote a book, Jewish Reflections on Death. But there wasn't a lot of Jewish death literature like, at all. But a few years later, my teacher, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi of blessed memory said, oh, afterlife, you want to study afterlife, go look here, 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 and here. And he pointed me into sort of the pre-modern Jewish world. And I did a, a, a psychology PhD. Only in California could you write on life after death and Judaism with applications for working with the dying and bereaved. And then my first job afterwards was as resident psychologist in a Jewish funeral home. That's there. I, that's where I really cut my teeth and learned a lot. And so over the years, I've I've had to, you know, I, I I've been both through my teaching and my own counseling. I do bereavement work. I've I've had a lot of conversation with people. So the first I I got the microphone by the way. So I get to ask the first question. So what did you learn about what Judaism has to say about life after death? You know, are, we're, are we live on, on camera? Because if you could see all of these faces here, they're all of these confused faces, like as if I asked them, like, like you know, what, what's the composition of, of, of the moon? Yeah, please. Here, here's a, there's a mic going around. I did learn from my parents that giving charity for your sight does elevate the soul of the deceased that I learned. Okay. I also remember, and maybe I've gotten this wrong, that the people buried in Jerusalem will be first ascend to heaven or be resurrected. Uh, I forget what it was. And so what happens if you happen to be buried in, uh, you know, Summit, New Jersey? Tough luck. No, the Hebra Kadisha in a traditional Tahara will put a stick in the hand or in the coffin of the deceased so you Spiritual can dig GPS. through to, to Jerusalem. I, I'm no, no kidding. I mean, that, that's, that's a minhag. Yeah, please. 
Yeah. It's a spiritual GPS because in fact, there's an underground railroad, like there was for the slaves to come up north, there's an underground railroad uh, to get uh, the bodies to Jerusalem at the time of the resurrection. <laughs> so now th this is very interesting. You're talking about the resurrection, which takes place at the end of time and history. So what happens to Joe and Jane Jew at the time of death, as opposed to what happened to them at the end of time and history. So part of the confusion about afterlife is we don't know whether we're talking about the days of the Messiah and re messianic re redemption, resurrection, or individual afterlife. So let's see what else. I want to hear what, yeah, please. Quite a while ago, I read a book called Does the Soul Survive? Yeah. Um, He's a nice guy. He, he quotes me. Yes. <laughs> Eli Spitz. It was very comforting because I hadn't actually questioned whether the soul survived. I've always felt that way. So, okay. So, so but it, it's interesting. There's what you've learned sort of like Judaism 2.0 as an adult, as opposed to what you might have learned growing up. I mean, anybody remember being taught anything about afterlife growing up? Here, please. Yeah, I had it. I'm not I, sure that's loud enough, but. I had an Orthodox teacher for many years, uh, uh, partners in Torah. And um, she, what she said is that the soul, when the person dies, the soul is in agony. And um, until the soul can ascend wherever, in her case, uh, to, to Hashem, um, you had to sit with that soul, the, the body, until that separation could occur. And in the truly righteous, the uh, Hasadim, um, that didn't have to happen. Okay, so it's interesting, you got a little vignettes, right? But how many of you got this one? Let me put on my good rabbinic voice. Judaism believes in life and the living. We're not so interested in the hereafter as other religions. Here and now, life and the living. Put up your hand if you heard that one. Okay, so here's what I need to tell you. It's true, but it's only half true. What's true is Judaism believes in the life and the living. It's in this world that we do mitzvot. The, 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 the Jewish imperative is to become mamlakat kohanim v'goy kadosh, a kingdom of priests and a, and a holy nation, and to, make, and to make this world holy. And at the end of time and history, when the messianic redemption happens, it's not going to happen in some transcendent realm, it's going to happen in the human realm here and now. But that doesn't mean that Jews don't believe in life after death. The notion that we don't have a view in Judaism of life after death is totally a modern sort of enlightenment Haskalah response. In the world of Isaac Basheva Singer and the Hasidic masters, there was never, ever any question. Fiddler on the roof, go look up Fiddler. Fiddler on the roof is in Hindi, is in Korean. I mean, if, go look on YouTube. It's all, it, it, they sort of take Shalom Aleichem's uh, afterlife teaching and they bring it all around, around the world because it's really a play about tradition versus modernity. But in that world, from a Sarah comes through from the other side. We, we, you know, we have this whole legacy and we lost touch with it. So there I am, it, it's, it's the early 70s, this, the, the, you know, this guy dies suddenly, I keep having a sense of him, and, and other than, you know, maybe Shirley MacLaine and, and Brian, um, Eli Spitz writes about Brian Weiss, who is a nice Jewish shrink who ended up studying life, life, after, life after death and, and, and past, past lives, there, there was very little. So in essence, what I ended up doing, if I may do a non-paid, non-political announcement available for, for purchase after, is I wrote the book I would have wanted to read when I was 21 and my closest friend was killed in a car accident. I mean, for some reason, that seems to have been the, the calling, if you will, in, in, in my own life. And so what I want to share with you in the next little while is... I guess a thumbnail sketch. Uh, you know, I, 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 I spent 10, 15 years reading everything I can get my hands on about life after death. 
So, so the first part is, no, it's not true that we don't believe in afterlife. But first of all, after Auschwitz, nobody wants to talk about afterlife. We grew up in the orb of Holocaust. And after Holocaust, the imperative was to settle refugees and to guarantee the existence of the state of Israel and to make sure that, that life for Jews was, was safe in diaspora countries. It wasn't to focus on the state of, 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 of six million souls. So um, yeah, so I, I, I'm gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at a text. I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm gonna weave together some teachings from Kabbalah, from Hasidism, and, uh, and continue to enter into conversation dialogue with you. So anyone comments, questions? Because I'm gonna tell you a story in a minute, please. Well, Jews do death and dying well, actually, when they do it, they do. And, and we do have a whole wonderful tradition of guidelines for dealing with dying and death and burial and mourning. It's almost as if we took all the philosophical questions out of that because of modernity. It, it, it's like I'm thinking of, uh, you know, when my mother used to squeeze fresh orange juice, you know, she would use a little strainer and take all the pulp out of it before we would drink it. So we took the pulp, we took the philosophical and spiritual pulp out of a lot of Judaism in the name of rationalist thinking and modernity. I went into a synagogue in Montreal not that long ago, and um, it was a Sephardi synagogue, and a lot of the people there were were women who had been raised in um, Iraq and Iran, sort of, you know, re refugees to Canada. And I asked them, what did you learn about afterlife? And all across the board, they had learned so much more than American Jews have. It was very, very interesting. Like, like they, they had learned a lot of that stuff. So I, I think, I think um, Judaism in America in the 60s and 70s basically picked up a kind of secular attitude closer to American Protestantism. Our Judaism is Protestantized. I mean, and, and, and it's good that we have all these laws and a lot of people don't, don't even know those. Another common question, and then I'm gonna tell you a story, please. Very interesting. There's a, a, a guy by the name of, I forget his name. That happens when you, right? Um, he was, he was a, a German Jewish philosopher in the 1840s. And he's writing a kind of midrash on Jacob was gathered to his ancestors. Because when we read it in Tanakh, Jacob is gathered to, to his ancestors. And he writes, when Jacob is gathered to his ancestors, what that really means is he lives on through his descendants. But that's where it comes from. It comes from German Jewish philosophy. Uh, you know, that, that's, that, nowhere is that in, in traditional rabbinic understanding. That's, in, that's sort of, again, in the period of Haskalah, of enlightenment, of, of rationalism. And, and so it gets stripped away. And, then, and, and we buy into that as sort of the Jewish the Jew, Jew, Jewish view. Yeah, please. Look, Judaism has a semi-permeable membrane. Judaism has been very, very good at, at, at adapting to different cultures over the course of time and history. And we take in some of the best stuff and we, we keep evolving and changing. It's interesting. So, so it, you know, it, it, throughout history, Judaism picked up stuff from, from Babylonian culture and from Greco-Roman culture and, and um, sort of early Christianity. There was, there was some good stuff that we picked up and, and Muslim culture um, and, and then sort of Western, Western rationalism. Today, what Judaism is picking up is Eastern religions. 
it's very interesting. The, the spiritual renewal of Judaism is coming from a lot of people who sort of went to study with Swami Meshugananda and other kinds of uh, sort of in, in, Indian teachers. So I don't know, you know, it's neither good nor bad. It just, that's just how it, how, how it is. But, 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 but the problem is that people are, are looking for something that, that's gotten lost. One more, and then I'm going to tell a story. Here's what I say to those people. I am not selling belief. Because if I say believe and you say I don't believe, then we're in an adversarial relationship. I will sell you my book, mind you, but I'm not going to sell belief, okay? So at least understand. You see, ultimately, I think we have to make our own decisions about meaningfulness around the reality of, of, of human mortality. You know, everybody has to find their own way. So in that sense, I want to say I'm speaking as a Jewish scholar to at least help you understand that this is in our tradition. And, and you'll see there's some really fascinating stuff that we didn't even know was there, but it was really very much front and center once you start scratching the surface. Everybody has to make their own meaning making around that one. So talk to me later about the book. Um, OK, so here, here's a story. So here, here's, here's the next phase. I'm going to tell you a Hasidic story. And then we're going to look at, the, at, at this text and we're going to put together in a blender a little bit of Hasidism, a little bit of Kabbalah, a little bit of Californian psychology and some of your own experiences. And this is sort of my, my working hypothesis for the Jewish view of the afterlife. Okay, story told of Rebbe Elimelech of Lezhensk. Elimelech of Lezhensk was one of the early and great Hasidic masters. And he had a friend who was a great Torah scholar and his friend comes up to him and says, I don't know why it is, but my time to leave the world is rapidly approaching. And he says to Rebbe Elimelech, can you do me a favor? So Elimelech says, you know, you know, sure, what do you need? He says, can you educate my son in the ways of the Jewish people and take care of him? And Elimelech says, sure, but on one condition. What do you mean on one condition? What kind of condition do you make with a guy who's dying? He says, I'll take care of your son on the condition you come back and tell me what it's like on the other side. So they shake, it's a gentleman's agreement, and, you know, Eli Melech does everything to really make sure he takes care of the kid, you know, it comes a time of the bar mitzvah, they had two bands, I mean, it was, you know, he really does this with, with, with a lot of integrity all the way through up into time of the marriage, because in this culture, if you're going to educate a young book or a young, uh, you know, a young man, also they're going to make a, 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 you know, a shidduch, an arranged marriage, you know, according to an alternate text that, that, that he was able to choose whatever gender he wanted to marry. But anyways, that's, that, that, that's, that, 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 that fits in in this, in this synagogue. Um, so, and also he does it fully, you know, she had, a, she had a master's degree, she had been to the orthodontist. I mean, you know, it was really a classy shidduch. Comes the afternoon of the wedding, the groom's family is there, the bride's family is there, and Rebbe Elimelech, who was both the stand-in for the groom's late father and, and, and the officiating rabbi, was nowhere to be found. You know, this, this was a problem. You know, the ordeals were getting cold, the guests were getting kvetchy, they wait an hour, they wait two hours, they send somebody to go look at the Rebbe's study, they peek through the keyhole, the Rebbe's meditating. Oi, the Rebbe's meditating, you know, you're not going to bother him whatever like after three hours he comes he does the wedding they you know they, they they break the glass they cry out mazel tov and then he gets up to address the guests at the reception because i suppose you're wondering where i was so let me tell you a story so he proceeds to tell the guests the story of the arrangement he had made with the groom's late father and he said here i had fulfilled my part of the bargain and he hadn't shown up so I'm sitting and I'm going to wait until he shows up. I'm sitting in my study, waiting and waiting. I hear Elimelech, Elimelech, Chaim, Chaim, is that you? What was it like? He said, the, he says, this is what he told me. He said, the moment of death was absolutely painless. It was as if it was taking hair out of milk. And I could see the people shrying and crying. I said, stop, I'm over here. But they couldn't see me. And they couldn't hear me. I figured, you know what? They made a mistake. They'll figure it out. And again, I could see the Hebra Kadisha, the burial society preparing my body. And I said, we're wasting your time. I'm, oh, I'm right over here. But again, I could not be seen. I could not be heard. I figured, you know what? 
they'll bury me, I'll come back, I'll explain it, and it'll all be okay. So I follow the procession out to the, out to the cemetery, and then everybody leaves, and I have this burning, burning desire. I have to get back to where I'm going. And I'm digging up furiously and it's starting to thunder and it's starting to lightning. And I think maybe I should stay. No, no, I can't stay. I have to go. No, no, I should stay. Good, do I stay? Do I go? Do I stay? Do I go? I get a little confused? I go out, help. All of a sudden, there appears before my eyes this great, 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 great being of light. And this being of light says, don't you know, you're no longer in the world of confusion. You've entered the universe of truth. And instantly I could see a panoramic vision of every single deed I have ever done in my life. And I'm to stand in judgment. And I wait and I wait. And then the judgment comes from the heavenly tribunal. And basically, I've been a God-fearing man. Basically, I try to serve my creator. I don't enter into Gehenna, purgatory. But there are ways in which I could have more fully fulfilled my destiny. There are ways in which I certainly could have paid my synagogue dues on time. That's for sure. So I don't enter into the heavenly garden of Eden. So what's going to happen to me, I ask? So I'm assigned a resting place in between the heavenly garden of Eden on one hand and the, and the lower world of Gehenna of purgatory. And on one hand, I see the torments of Gehenna and my soul is cleansed of further defilements. And I see the lofty heights of Gan Eden and I, and I aspire to higher, higher levels of being. And there I stay. Now it says in Jewish tradition that on Shabbat, all souls are released from Gehenna. They say Shabbat's a taste of the world to come. The first Shabbat comes, I enter into Gan Eden, and it was fantastic. It was blissful. It was sublime. Shabbos ends. The messenger of heaven tribunal says, come on, you have to go back to your resting place into, in between Gehenna and Gan Eden. I said, forget it. I like it here. He said, no, no, you have to go. I said, you know what? You go tell the heavenly tribunal that I knew Rebbe Elimelech, and I studied Torah with him, and I should merit to be in Gan Eden. So the messenger goes and comes back from the heavenly tribunal and says, it has been determined on high that you shall take your place in Gan Eden eventually. But in your lifetime, you made a promise to Rebbe Elimelech. And until you fulfill that promise that you had made to Rebbe Elimelech, you can't rightfully take your place in Gan Eden. So Rebbe Elimelech is at the wedding and he's telling everybody their story and he continues. He says, so I said to him, come on, let's go. We'll make a l'chaim, you know, come to your son's wedding. He says, where I'm going is so blissful, so sublime. I can't wait a second longer. As it is, it took me so long to be able to get back here. So you go to the wedding and when you go to the wedding, you make a l'chaim on my behalf and you ask everybody at the wedding tell everybody they know the story and make a l'chaim on my behalf and to tell everybody they know, to tell everybody they know, to tell everybody they know the story and make a l'chaim on my behalf. So I want to say l'chaim, 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 and I share with you that story exactly as it was first told to me. So that, my friends, is a Jewish view of the afterlife. And Looking around the room, I could see some of you would remember way back in the day when Joseph Campbell would appear on, on late night PBS talking about, about the, the power of myth was, I think, the name of the series. So he would say in that story is a mythic depiction of the afterlife journey of the soul. The traditional thinking about a world beyond the grave about afterlife in terms of the fundamentalists because we're you know whether you're whether you're a, a practicing jew or not we're influenced by by pro american protestant fundamentalist thinking even if you say i don't believe any of that crap right it's very geographical it's not a journey it's a location and i you know my son went to university of uh, indiana university and on the ride from from Bloomington to Indianapolis to the airport, there was a sign that would say, avoid hell, repent. And I always pulled over and checked my GPS to make sure I didn't take the wrong turn and end up in hell, right? But that, that's in our thinking. In, in this mythic depiction, afterlife is not a location, it's a journey. While we're alive, we are on a journey, you know? Life is getting, I don't know, somewhere between interesting and, 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 and frightening in these days, right? But we're on a journey. And in this understanding, I'm going to go from the chart to the text. 
we're a, we're an amalgam of spirit, mind, emotion, and body. You know that's what it means. That's the, the you know the yud hey vav hey here is is uh, you know we're made in the image of God. So in the kabbalistic understanding, we're body, emotion, mind, and spirit. You know, don't have to take my word for it. You know, how are you doing? These chairs look relatively comfortable. I hope you didn't have too many carbs. I'm speeding a little bit from the coffee. I never liked Dunkin' Donuts coffee, but anyways, right? And then emotion, you know, there's a like good vibe in the room. You know each other, right? Mind, you know, you're looking, looking at me. You say, I think this guy knows what he's talking about. I'm not so sure yet, but you're giving me the benefit of the doubt. And then there's a place where we connect to spirit where, where who we are is interwoven into the fabric of the universe. I just ordered, I got it yesterday, a, a poster of one of those new images from the Webb telescope. And I put it over my, my, the corner where I sit and meditate. It's like, my wife, why do you do that? I said, well, that, if I think about God in those terms, it's very different, right? So, so to be a spiritual being is to be interwoven to this fabric of this fascinating universe. We're just a little, you know, a little speck and we're cognitive, emotional, and physical beings. In death, those different realms separate and go through a journey of transformation. Okay, so that's, that's where I'm going with this. While we're alive, we're body, emotion, mind, and spirit. In death, there's a separation. Now I'm giving you the big picture, and then we're going to look at the details. There's a, my charts, by the way, go from the bottom on up, okay? We, th there's a separation from the physical body. What you talked about earlier of, you know, sort of like, they use the word torments of the grave, but you'll see I want to talk about it a little differently. Physically separating, emotional purgation, is sort of like um, burping onions and garlic if you just had a strong, strong uh, Italian meal, right? We have, to, we have to finish, process some of the unresolved emotional stuff of life. Intellectual contemplation in the sense of seeing God and spiritual unification in the sense of returning to God. So this is the journey of the soul after death that I'm going to show you. We have texts on. And I realize I need to see, I see that I don't have, I'm not doing my Zoom screen sharing. I have, I needed one more chart, but anyways. Okay, so I want to start looking at some, some, some of the text. Anybody want to comment on that story? Any images stand out for you in that story? Yeah, please. Right. Okay, so go back into that story, that scene where the, 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 the soul is saying, do I go, do I stay, do I go, do I stay, do I go? What, am I being called to go to the other side? What, you know, what, what images would you use? What words would you use to describe just that scene? What's going on? Torment, right? Confusion. And it's also a kind of grasping here. Mike, grab my hand. Right, pull. See, I haven't been able to do this in twenty in, in thirty months. You know, right? This it's it's sort of like this. Nishtahe, nishtahe. Am I here? Am I there? I'm here. I'm right there. That is described in our tradition as chibut hakever. That's the main new word you're going to learn today. The pangs of the grave. They didn't teach you this in Hebrew school, okay? The pangs of the grave is said to be a three to seven day period of time when the soul is potentially confused as to whether it's alive or dead. There seems to be some kind of limbo or intermezzo phase. The Catholics took limbo and they made a whole theological term and, and you know, unbaptized babies and that I don't, I don't qualify. I was delivered by a nun. You can be damn sure they baptized me, right? I, I, it's called a pang, I call it the winnowing. There's a certain, it's sort of like uh, when, you know, like I remember, I'm th I don't know why it comes to me, but, you know, I'm thinking of like coming into the house after being out in a snowstorm, you sort of have to like, you know, shake off the snow and, 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 and the snow on your boots. So there seems to be a period of time immediately after death that the soul has to give up its attachments to the physical world. Now I say potentially, you know how some people are able to go through life 
look, you've lived long enough to know that, that as my kid said to me when he was a young kid, he said, ah, but shit happens. You know, like there's death suffering in, in, in the world. It, it happened. And some people are able to go through the losses of life and shake it off and go forward. And other people go through life bitching and moaning. It, some souls are able to say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a royalist, so you'll forgive me. You know, like Queen Elizabeth, I did my job. And I'm ready to check out of here. I've done what I had to do. I performed my last duty. And now I'm ready to go. And I'm going to go gracefully. And some people are oiska mitched and have a harder time. So there's, there is this early phase of the separation of, of the body from the soul. That interestingly, I have Shiva, Punal, Kavra, Kadisha, but it corresponds with the Shiva. Now, what do we do at the end of the Shiva? Go on a diet. Yeah, yeah, I know that one. What? Why do you walk around the block? Why do you walk around the block? Right? So it, it, we understand the, these things psychologically. It, you know, I've taken this time out of time, and now I'm going to go back into life. But there's also a spiritual component. As if to say to the soul, we can walk you this far, and now you have to go the rest of the way on your own. And, uh, you know, I, my, my wife, when her father died, it was Parsha Vayachi. It was the Parsha of, of Jacob's uh, deathbed. And, it's, and she said, before we walked around the block with her, she said, it says Jacob was gathered to his ancestors. Who are the ancestors to whom my father has been gathered? And we went around the room and we named some of people that we knew, that, that, you know, our contemporaries. And, and my father-in-law's cousin was there, so they named their mutual gr grandmother. And all of a sudden it became, we we're walking her to walking him to be able to meet up with those folks. So there is this early phase of leaving go of the attachments to the body. Yeah, please. Right. Yes. Right. Right. They're going to freak out. Right, 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 right. Right. No, there's a, or, or like the Tahara with the Tahrichim, the, the, the shrouds. The shrouds don't have any, any knots. Any, any, when they stitch it, they leave it, they leave it unknotted. So that this, there's no reason, there's no problem for the soul to leave the body. In uh, when it happens in a hospital in an Orthodox family, they'll open the windows in 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 the, in the hospital room to allow the soul to be able to leave. So we have all of those practices that allude towards this notion of some kind of departure of the soul from the body, and and they nobody mentioned that. Nobody, you know, n nobody mentioned that. Um, okay, so uh, you want to uh, thank you. You you were a great you were a great welcoming host. So you get to read the first text over here. Kibuta Kever, top of the page. Rabbi, <clears throat> Rabbi Yehuda said, "For seven days the soul goes to and fro from this his house to his grave, from his grave to his house, mourning for the body." That's a very, they never taught you that in Hebrew school. I mean, that's, that, to me, that, 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 that makes the whole mourning period in a very different way. You know, people like two sisters are sitting around the house. It's, it's, the, it's, you know, it's the third night of the Shiva. You couldn't have another cold cut if they gave it to you intravenously. I mean, you just couldn't. You just couldn't. And, you know, Uncle Lou just left, so there's no more bad sexist jokes. And the sisters are sitting around saying, didn't it feel like daddy was here? And people have those experiences. And, and we don't have a Jewish understanding. You know, it, it, when, when somebody calls me and says, you know, there's a sudden death, what I'll say to them is just sit quietly. Because the ghost phenomena. Is it, if somebody dies suddenly, they may be more likely confused as to whether they're alive or dead. I mean, the, you know, so like one of my friends, his, his, I think his brother was either murdered, he was killed, somebody else I know was killed, and, 
um, a mountain climbing accident, so just sit around and let him know it's okay to go. And, and people have dreams, people have these meaningful coincidences, and we don't, we don't have a philosophical understanding. And I want to say, look, it's, it's right there. It's right in our tradition. We're seven days. The soul goes to and fro from the grave to house morning for the body. Yeah, please. Well, well there's a lot of text in that. And, and, and um, uh, you know, a lot of our iconography is, um, I mean, first of all, we don't have very good Jewish iconography of death. You know, we don't have a good Jewish iconography because you shouldn't, shan't have, you shan't, shan't have any images, right? But there's, there's one rabbinic text where, you know, the angel of death has, you know, 900 eyes or something like that. And that we're actually going from the image of death as a grim reaper to death as a being of light. We, we seem to be evolving as a culture with some of these near-death experiences, but we, you know, we definitely have stuff in our tradition about, about, about the angel of death. Okay, so why don't, we, yeah, please. Let me, let me, um, let me, let me hold that. Let me, let's do a couple of these images here, and then, and then I want to say something better. Okay, but I I, I want to keep that. It, it, don't let me go. Don't let me go to Gehenna because then uh, I want I I, 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 I want to do a, I want I want to do a couple of other images of the early phase and then and then we can continue that conversation about cremation. So there are, there are said to be a whole series of deathbed visions that correspond with this early phase. You want to read you want to read the first one, the ancestral guides, familial beings. Here, we, we want to put you on the mic, Jack. Oh, oh. Rabbi Shimon said, have you seen today the image of your father? For so we have learned that at the hour of a man's departure from the world, his father and his relatives gather around him and he sees them and recognizes them. And likewise, all with whom he, he associated in this world and they accompany his soul to the place where it is to abide. So that's sort of like the mummy daddy Bubby Zaidi level. So, so there's said to be these vi visions. There's two kinds. One is sort of the familial beings, and the other one are sort of like the, the mythic beings of light, if you will. So this stuff is what corresponds 100% with the near-death experiences, where people are pronounced clinically dead and later resuscitated. So one of my bereavement clients was sitting with me one day and she said, I was sitting at my mother's deathbed and my mother looks up and says, oh, mom, I never introduced you to my daughter. The dying woman has a vision of her deceased mother and is introducing her mother to her daughter who is sitting there. So people have all these stories. Now, you know, back 30 years ago, I remember, you know, some guy in, in hospice jumped out of bed. Oh, my brother, my brother, my brother. And they, they brought him back into bed and they strapped him down and gave him Thorazine. You know, today the hospice nurses are much more aware of those kinds of stories. Anybody have a, a little narration along those lines? That, 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 yeah, please. I was told a story. Um, he was a rabbi and his father was a rabbi. So shortly before he died, and he wasn't really sick, he died of a sudden heart attack. He said that I was at the cemetery and he would go to the cemetery often to say prayers and things. And I was lost. And my father appeared and gave me directions. Wow. And he died shortly after that. And when he died, they would, you know, they filled in the graves one after the other. You know, you didn't have like a, you know, you weren't buried with your spouse. So there was an opening right behind his father's grave wow. and that's where he is today well you know my mother was 10 years old when her father was killed in a car accident so i come to this multi-generationally and you know growing up she would talk about her father not in, not in a morbid way but more in like you know a little bit of a bitter bittersweet way so she was in her 80s i said mom you might see your father when you die and she says wow like she, she just lit up like thinking about that i said daddy my father 
daddy's probably going to be late. He's probably going to be caught at Home Depot or something. Because, you know, my father would never come home for Shabbos dinner on time. He was always in, you know, some hardware store or something like that. So, uh, yeah, so people have these kinds of experiences. Okay, uh, somebody else read. Uh, let's pass the mic on. Somebody, you want to you wanna just read, read the next one? Our typal beings of light. Typal beings of light. When a person departs this world, he sees many strange things on his way and meets Adam, the first man, sitting at the gate of Gan Eden, ready to welcome all who have observed the commands of their master. No man dies before he sees the Shekhinah. Shekhinah, and because of its deep yearning for the Shekhinah, the soul departs in order to see her. And with the Shahina, there comes three ministering angels to receive the soul of the righteous. Again, they never taught us stuff like that. First of all, we don't have a very good iconography. So we, you know, like, like modern feminism, notwithstanding, you know, even if, if your daughter and my wife are both reconstructionist women rabbis, uh, the Shahina is not a woman with a talus and Birkenstocks, you know, I mean, uh, Right. In rabbinic literature, the Shekhinah is this luminescent kind of being. It's a sense of, of, of luminosity and presence. But we don't have an image of what a, of Adam looks like. But this is, this is the, the mythic stuff in the near-death experience where the Christians see Jesus or Mary and the Hindus see Krishna and the Buddhists see the Buddha and the Jews see someone from the Federation. <laughs> I say that again. Good, good standing. So this story blew me out of the water. I had an uncle who was of the vintage who ran away from the Tsar's army after World War I. He came to America, he came to Canada, he made his fortune. He was rapidly, rapidly anti-religious. He hated everything to do with religion. You know, he worked 20 hours a day, he made his fortune. He was, he was who he was, he was a character. He said to me, I was visiting him, he said, I nearly died. And the Rabon Gomliel came and said, Yoine, it's not your time. He was our uncle Yonis, you know, John. So, you know, Yoinele, they call him. Who shows up for him but Rabbi Gamliel from his Talmudic youth in the yeshiva in Europe? And this was not a guy who would have read Raymond Moody's Life After Life, or he wouldn't have even seen Heaven Can Wait with Warren Beatty. If you remember, that was the earliest movie on near death experiences and defending your life and Sixth Sense and all of those. So it says to me that there seem to be some kind of helping beings that help people leave behind this world and they get painted in the cultural iconography of a person's cultural context you know so some of the stuff on children and your death experience you know who they're seeing today yoda you know yoda is sort of like a multi-dimensional being so i don't know how this stuff works but i think the the bottom line the takeaway with this is that there are beings there are guides whether it's familial beings or mythic guides that help people leave this world at the time of death yeah Yes. Right. So I, I, I do a very reconstructionist thing here. I do biblical, I do apocryphal, I do rabbinic, I do medieval philosophy, medieval midrash, I do Hasidism. Kabbalah, and then in this new, this is, I'm proud to say this is the 25th anniversary edition, I do Yiddish folk literature. So throughout, throughout the whole evolution of Judaism, there are all of these different kinds of depictions of some sense of connection between this world and the world beyond. It's there all the time. And listen, and Zohar, yes, Zohar was written in Spanish, Sephardic culture, but remember, Zohar the rabbis of the Zohar were not separate from the, the, the Judaism of the Mishnah, and the Torah, the Mishnah, and the Talmud. I mean, now, you know, the, 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 this is like their graduate degree. You know, this is like their 2.0 or their, or, or, or their 3.0. It's really with modernity that we lose touch with that. But all of, the, all of these pieces are really 
sort of hardwired into the in, into the into, into the tradition all along. Okay, so um, one more, and then I want to talk about cremation for a bit. Uh, 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 a minute. Um, somebody read the, the next one about the life review. We're going to give it to uh, Arlene. You, you, you're the president. Oh my goodness! You work hard. Go. When God desires to take back a man's spirit, all the days that he has lived pass before him in review. Yeah. So that's a life review. That's a life. You know what? What? What's? What's the practical implication of that? Tell your story. People need to tell their story. But you know, I, I, I when I when I was teaching undergraduate, I'd say, you know, go home for Thanksgiving, put your uh, grandparents in front of your iPhone, and get them to tell their story. I have eight hours of both of my parents on videotape, and and I, and I value I value it a lot. So the life review is where you get a chance to look over the life and say, you know what, uh, it was what it was. Now, look, it's cast in theological language. I, you know, I I went to school in California, so I sort of speak in more of a of a trans a trend a humanistic transcendent transcendentalist. My teacher, Rabbi but it's understood that your your life is seen flash. You know, not only flashes before your eyes, but be, before God. Okay. So these are the early phases of the separation from the body. And then, then another whole part comes up on, on Gehenna. So I want to say this about cremation. I want to say it's very, very complex. It's, it's a very, very complex issue. Um, if, if you go in the traditional sense, they say you don't want to cremate the body because of the resurrection of the dead you, you know where what body you're gonna land in you know my aunt said to the her chabad rabbi rabbi when when the mashiach comes am i gonna my husband jack died and before him my husband joe died i'm not sure i want to be with either of them <laughs> right and, and and it's very what does that mean i mean like do we moderns really believe that the body will reconstitute itself. And actually, the Kabbalists downplayed physical resurrection because they did more on, on Gilgul and, 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 and reincarnation. That being said, um, and let me sit down for a sec. I think that somewhere upwards of 30, 40% of American Jews are going for reincarnation, uh, re re cremation these days. You know, when you, like, if you factor out New Jersey and New York and Connecticut and Pennsylvania, when, you know, like, I mean, there are congregations in Missoula, Montana that are like 90% intermarried congregations. You know, the Jewish community is not your grandparents' Jewish community anymore. I think the problem or challenge that we're facing and here i want to speak to the reconstruction notion of judaism being an, being an evolution the problem that we're facing is finding a way to sacramentalize cremation i, I want to say like this if you don't want to be cremated then don't be cremated okay but some people are choosing that you know one of my wife's congregants years ago when she had a reconstruction congregation in center city philadelphia asked to be given a full tahara and then to be cremated which is a contradiction in terms in some ways but those are the kind of contradictions that are changing the the texture of things so um I don't know where it's all going. Yeah, please. Uh, a question related to this. Wouldn't, uh, when someone gives their body uh, and uh, has organ donation, right. isn't that the same thing? The body won't be whole. You know, a person can give many different organs at once from right. their body, including their eyes, face tissue, um, well, you know, I think even in Israel that they they they're permitting that now. You know, it's like the value of pikuach nefesh, saving a life, 
transcends this is issue. Now, it's interesting, in the early 1800s, there was, I believe it was an Italian rabbi, who was a reform rabbi, who asked to be cremated. And somebody wrote a book getting like every single Orthodox rabbi on the continent of Europe to condemn that. And, and it brings in the whole thing of reincarnation. Uh, uh, it brings in the whole thing of you can't be cremated because of the resurrection of the dead. But that's not in there prior to that. That's, not, that, that's part of the sort of the, the, the modern response or the, the traditionalist response to modernity. I, I, I just, you know, I, I just want to say it's one of the complex problems that's facing Jewish life going into 21st century. And it will be. Yeah, please. Right. Well, that, again, that's that's sort of the modern that that's the traditional response to to modern cremation. Uh, you know, Reb Zalman writes writes a um, a foreword to to my book. He says, "Do I really believe that that?" That these dead bodies will rise up from the crypts. It it may be that we're talking about sort of like like all of organic life be, uh, uh, becoming animated again, and we don't you know right now it's almost as if we see the planet as dead matter, you know like we don't treat it as if it's really or uh, alive. So I don't know. I I, I just I, we're not going to resolve this. I'm going to do one more question, and then I want to move on. But I think that ultimately everybody has to make their own decisions of upon that and uh, these are the kind of conversations you need to have with your family members please You know, on the other hand, if you go to India, they 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 cremate you more quickly because it helps the soul be released from the body and, and it avoids the pangs of the grave. It avoids Hibuta Kever. So, yeah, please. Um, doesn't that relate to what someone said before and what you said about Judaism taking things from the culture, uh, the diaspora that right. we happen to be in at any given moment? and somehow finding a way to incorporate that and creatively creating more Jewish law. Right. That's why we're trying to figure this one out. Yeah. And it's gonna take Which a couple of generations. We will. Okay, so I wanna make sure that, I, that I'm gonna run out of time and I wanna make sure I get you in and out of Gehenna. And, and, and so eventually the, 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 the separation from the body is completed. And then there's this other realm known as Gehenna. And Gehenna is a kind of purgation process. How, how, how do I want to? How do I want to say this? Um, you know, somebody. Uh, I have a fight with my friend, my friend Joe. You know, and he comes up and he kicks me in the shins and he spits in my face. And then six months later, you come up to me and you say, yeah, "Whatever happened, to your friend Joe?" I go, "Joe, did I ever tell you what happened? I am so furious with him." What's the point? Emotions persist long after the initial point of contact. So we're very good as human beings at repressing emotion, right? So you have a, you have a fight with your significant other and, and you go to sleep, you wake up the next day and you have a, a, a lower backache because you feel unsupported or your, your neck hurts because there's a pain in the neck or your abdomen hurts because you can't stomach it anymore. Or Louise Hay would say you get a bladder infection because you're pissed off, right? We know about psychosomatic medicine. We know that the body holds all of these emotions. It may be that in death, there's a certain amount of undigested and un processed emotional residue 
not about you know the guy i had a, an encounter with at the gas station over something stupid but about our our intimate our intimacy circles our 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 important relationships so gehenna seems to be some kind of process of purging or purifying all of the unresolved residues uh, in, in, in life now it comes the term gehenna comes out of the biblical term gay ben hinom the valley of the sons of hinom the that that, that was where they 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 uh, carried out child sacrifice though having raised teenagers i understand why some species eat their young but that's a that's a, a different story okay so um i want to read i want some i need somebody who's got a little bit of shakespearean schmaltz to read Gehenna, um, the realm of purgation and purification. Give, give, okay, you got it, I'm, please. A little, little schmaltz here. This is, this is the Jewish Dante material, okay? Uh, Gehenna, realm of purgation and purification. Closer still. There are five kinds of punishment in Gehenna, and Isaiah saw them all. He entered the second compartment, and he saw two men hanging by their tongues. And he said, O oh, you who unveils the hidden, reveal to me the secret of this. He answered, These are the men who slandered, therefore they are thus punished. He entered the third compartment, and he saw there men hanging by their organs. He said, O oh, you who unveils the hidden, reveal to me the secret of this. And he answered, these are the men who neglected their own wives and committed adultery with the daughters of Israel. Okay, so listen, if you're going to visit, you know, an elderly aunt in hospice, don't read this one, okay? <laughs> but it's very good for pedagogical purposes because, first of all, it's a genre of literature called midah keneged midah. Uh, the punishment fits the crime. So you sin from the mouth, you sin from the tongue, you, you're, you're punished accordingly, you have sins of sexual impropriety, you're punished that way. But what, 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 what am I trying to suggest? How does this help us understand Gehenna? Gehenna is seen in our tradition as almost like what they call in the 12-step program, the fearless moral inventory, where you, what would it be to look at your life unadorned with defensiveness or, or avoidance and see your relationship history and all the times you shot, you shot from the lip and were verbally abusive to people you love. It might feel like hanging from the tongue. What would it be to look at your, your life and history and see times you might have acted with impropriety in your intimate relationships and hurt people you love? It might feel like hanging from... Mm. So what we have here in Gehenna is it becomes an opportunity to sift through the residue of life. Now, the rabbi said, avoid Gehenna, do mitzvahs. You know, how do you avoid the, 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 the Gehenna? You give money to tzedakah, you study Torah, you, you know, so there's a whole, a whole protocol. Gehenna is not guaranteed, okay? How long do we say Kaddish for? The maximum length of time in Gehenna is 12 months. Why do we only say Kaddish for 11 months? You wouldn't want to think that your parent got the maximum length of time, though. Some of my psychotherapy clients, my parents, they say my parents should have gotten 36 months, right? Now, what's really interesting is that just as, as the Chibuta Kever corresponds with the Shiva, Gehenna corresponds with Kaddish. And it said that our saying Kaddish has the potential to redeem souls from Gehenna, to which I say, what the hell does that mean? So here is my Kaddish, I call this my Kaddish Gehenna rap. All right, this is, this is how I understand what it means. It's the first day saying Kaddish, the guy shows up at synagogue, Yit Kaddav Yit Kadash. You SOB, you didn't leave a life insurance policy. You liked your work more than you liked your kids. And now I have to say these stupid words. So this, I do this as a, as a son to a father, but you can imagine anyway. 
And the soul on the other side says, and you, you were a pain that took us to raise. You were always so busy with your friends. You never had time for your family. You didn't make my life any, any easier. Two months, three months, you'd go, you know what, Dad? I didn't know you. I didn't know who you were. And the response comes back and says, you're right. I didn't know me either. What did I know? You know, I was taught how to go to work and make a living. I, you know, now I've had a couple of months since I've died. I've been, I, I've been able to look at my life a little bit and see, you know. Five months, six months, you know what, Dad? I never heard you say, I love you. I never heard you say, I love you. And the response comes back and says, of course I love you. I never heard it myself growing up, but yes, I love you. And I, and you know, and I, I made a lot of mistakes. I, I see that now. Eight months, nine months. because You know what, uh, today, today I really, really miss you. Just today, I don't know why. I got, woke up today and today I really miss you. And the response comes back and says, look, I really, really missed you. And I, I hope you find a way to forgive me. I, I you know, I, I, I love you and I'm sorry for some of the things I did or didn't do. It's the last day of St. Kaddish. We need a better way of ending Kaddish. It could all be good. You know what? I've been angry. I've missed you. I've been sad. But today I just want to say I love you and I forgive you. And the response comes back and says, look, take what I can, to, take what you can that was good and leave go of the rest. And I bless you on the journey. And the year of St. Kaddish is over. And is that redeeming souls from Gehenna? I don't know, but I think what it suggests is the Jewish understanding is the, there's a continuity of relationship that continues after death. Death ends a life, but it doesn't end a relationship. The relationship continues. I mean, I had somebody I worked with, her father was a raging alcoholic. And at one point, you know, and she did a lot of work on it in therapy. And at one point, he appears to her in a dream and he asks her for forgiveness. And it really was very powerful for her. Did it exactly happen that way? I don't know, but it suggests that there's a certain kind of continuity in the relationship and that changes it. I think the hardest part for people in dealing with death without an understanding of afterlife is how did it all end so fast and what's, what's there? But, but I, I say that the work of mourning is to go from mourning to meaning, from longing to legacy, from mourning to meaning, from longing to legacy. So when we, when we work through the sense of loss, but we feel the sense of the legacy of their life, we feel the sense of the blessing, we feel the sense of stuff that they taught us, that changes the, the name of the game significantly. And so this this whole notion of while we are doing the work of emotion of, of mourning the soul is also doing the work of cleansing and there's some interactive kind of relationship anyone comments questions i'm i'm, I'm uh, just doing a time check we're 12 12 i, I, I want to make sure that I, I i you know i said i wasn't going to leave you in gehenna but i still need to do at least quickly the, the other places comments questions because we're 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 moving we're going we're moving in time and Okay, the rabbis actually did three times the amount of writing on Gehenna than they did on Gan Eden. Interesting, if, if there's a book called Legends of the Jews, and if you look in there, they have, they have heaven and hell. In the index, there's three times on, on hell than there is on heaven. Why? Because they were primarily ethicists. The rabbis weren't, you know, after the destruction of the temple in the year 70, their, their imperative was to reboot Judaism and provides guidelines for people without the temple. And so while there are some rabbis that are more metaphysical than others, their, their edict was to create a, a, a meaningful Jewish life in, in diaspora communities without the priesthood without, and, 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 and without the temple and without sacrifice. Um, you know, and so that in a way I'm, I'm, I'm representing that because I, I, you know, I have less to say in, in, the, in the more esoteric realm, but Gan Eden is, 
I would say the harvest of one's spiritual accrual. It's like, you know, uh, I, I'm 70, I have to turn my RRSPs into something different now, right? So when, at what point do you harvest your, 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 um, my IRAs, I've been saying it. At what point do you, do you harvest your, your spiritual accrual? So there's said to be seven realms of Ghanaian. So how much do you have in your spiritual bank account? Are you going to get a Motel 6? Or are you going to get a Best Western? Or if you're a Kabbalist, you get a Best Western? Or you're going to get a, a, you know, a, a Hilton or an apartment on the Riviera, right? And interesting, it corresponds with the Yort site. Because at the time of the Yort site, the Chassidim say, the Nisham is Ohoban and Aliyah. The soul should ascend higher and higher. The belief of Isaac Luria and the Chassidim is that our remembering the deceased at the time of the Yort site helps their soul ascend higher and higher. And again, it's the sense that these, these realms continue. There's, the, the, there's, there's continuity. So, so with, 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 with Gan Eden, it said that there's family groupings, you know, like there's the Hadassah section in there and there's you know, the, 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 uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sisterhood and the brotherhood and the men's club. But it's the idea that the ancestors are together and that we reconnect with the ancestors and the ancestral realm. So in some places, Gan Eden is the end of the line. In other places, there's another realm called Tzror HaChayim. Where do we see that term used? Tombstone. Tehei nishmato tzorah b'tzror HaChayim. May his soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. Continue services on page 472. We do it very platitudinously, but it really is said to be a place where souls return to to get the next to, to get to get to get the message for the next incarnation. So you have the sense here with I, I correspond it with Yisker. It's like there's, you know, the, the mother goes, the woman goes to say Yisker and says, Ma, can I, you know, help me? I'm trying to have a child. And she shows up the next year with a newborn child that looks like the deceased grandmother. So the sense of perhaps there's a generational continuity of uh, th through time. So what you have here is this whole process of separating out from the body, cleaning up the emotional schmutz under the rug, seeing the divine and re-emerging and then and then it brings in the whole notion of Gilgul and reincarnation. So it's this whole notion that, 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 that life between birth and death is only 50% of the journey. The other half is between death and rebirth. And, and, and I think it changes the way in which we think about dying and death. It's, it's, it, it certainly does. So this is a little bit of a vignette of, of, of my own sense of Jewish view of the afterlife. And I'm glad to sit around and uh, address some of your, your questions and, uh, and see what else you need to say. So yeah, please. You know, this is very, very painful and very, very problematic. Um, it's said that when, so when there's a suicide, they, the person may be more attached to the physical realm and be more confused. You know, some of my friends who do sort of psychic work, it's like, you got to help people move on. So it may be in certain kinds of death, there's um, more trauma that, 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 that makes it harder for them to leave. Um, uh, one of the books I have here is, uh, I, I did the March of the Living. March of the Living was basically a romp through concentration camps for five days. And I walked into um, Majdanek. Majdanek is among the worst because it's closer to the Russian front. And as the, as the Russians came through, the Nazis were able to destroy more and more stuff further, further, further west. But Majdanek could actually be up and running as a death camp in 48 hours. I mean, the, the technology is there. And, you know, I mean, we're on a tour, you know, tour of gas chambers. Wow. Um, and I walked out and in and the Polish in April, the Polish countryside is this verdant, it's beautiful, perfect weather, 65 degrees, breezy, it smells good. And you walk through this massive death camp. And I walk out of gas. <coughs> 
God, I can't stop coughing. I'm coughing and I'm coughing and I'm coughing. And, you know, sometimes you can like choke on a little bit of water or something, right? And I lie down because I'm coughing uncontrollably and the sunlight is coming into my eyes. My eyes are closed and I go, go into the light, 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 go into the light. And, like, and it disappeared. And I just stopped coughing like that. And it felt like this mangled, gnarled being had attached onto me. There are definitely spirit attachments in places like that and Auschwitz and Gettysburg and that where there's sort of confused beings and souls. So the, my experience was it was literally a dibbuk that it sort of grabbed onto me. And, um, and, and you know, and that's sort of, the, so some beings uh, get stuck in, in in, in those realms. My teacher absolves that we need to go to Auschwitz to sort of liberate some of those, some of those souls. Comments? Please. Well, you know, that's the, you know, Judaism believes in life and living my own sense. This is useful, not because it's the best thing since sliced bread. I think it gives us the guidelines for dealing with grief and loss and mourning and living the fullness of our days. I mean, I think that's right. I, th I think that's right. You know, it, 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 it's very paradoxical in a way. My, you know, teaching on afterlife is to help people deal with with death and loss in this lifetime and that happens it happens to us it just it just does right right well you know we want we want to not be too attached to our vanity and the physicality we want to make sure we have good emotional relationships we want to make sure we invest in our spiritual well-being and in in our sense of connection with the divine yes thank you all right is that Right, cemetery. Yeah, they're not becoming an oxymoron because you know Jewish communities are more, you know, like the millennials. Their communities are much more cyber communities. In, in interesting, way. like this whole thing of all these Zoom services and you know and and all that stuff is it, is changing Jewish life in ways that we're not going to fully understand the longer term implications for for another decade but it's true when you know somebody uh, died 50 years ago in queens you know that's where the family was and that you know and and today you know they're in santa fe and they're in california and they're in connecticut and it's not the same thing i mean i'm from montreal and um, of my parents generation they said nobody had all three of their kids staying put in Montreal and uh, all the more so through the years. So the, 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 the area of the cemetery where my parents are buried was new when they first got in there. 
And there's still a wide open space because there's less Montreal Jews choosing to be buried there. Um, I tell people, uh, if you're not sure what to do, get a bench, you know, memorialize a bench in honor of your, 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 your loved ones. And people find that becomes their sacred site where, the, where, where they go to. So things are really, really changing because of, um, well, just, you know, because, because of, of, of mobility. And so it's this, the Jewish cemetery in, is, is, is very different, is, you know, is, is, is very, very different. I mean, I could, I could well, actually, my, my, it's interesting, my, my wife is from Knoxville. Oh, at one point, my mother, you know, there's only one cemetery there. My mother-in-law was in there a number of years ago, we were walking around and she said, I know more people here than back in town. Um, and my wife and I are going to be buried there because that's where she has five generations of, of families there. But that's becoming a rarity that in, in larger metropolitan areas, for sure. I've been given that pleasure to thank you of current education, pleasurable, in many ways, pleasurable, thoughtful morning. Uh, absolutely grateful to you for making the trip, for talking to us. And I think I speak for everyone here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I didn't remember if I knew how to teach people when not in front of a camera, you know, I mean, it's, it's really been a while. I guess I, I, I sort of won't get enough. On a more mundane note, everyone, don't forget to send in your reservation for the high holy days. All right. And if you want to buy Hanukkah presents now, I got some books. <laughs> Thank you.